Thank you for being here tonight. Live from Gilbert, Arizona at Town Hall in our council chambers. We have in Gilbert a special group. It's our Mayor's Youth Advisory Council. And some of the things that they've been doing this year, there was a focus on one of the issues that has been part of communities across America, and that's related to drugs. We've had some discussions over the last few years, and, and often it has been a member of the police department to give our community an update on certain things happening. We happen to have a special guest who we'll, we will introduce in just a couple of minutes that is here tonight to talk to us about drug trends in 2014 with a very specific update on a drug in communities across America that is of concern. We have our Mayor's Youth Advisory Council members here, members of school board, Police Department, we've also invited uh, faith group leaders and, and others in the community, and we do know of several groups that are watching this on Channel 11, and so we appreciate the information that will be provided to help our community. This is a community that is known as a safe community, but we also realize there are struggles, and tonight's information will help us. Will help us with awareness, will help us with knowing things that we need to be doing, and so we thank our presenter in advance again for being here. Before we um, get into the details, members of our Mayor's Youth Advisory Council, if you could come up here quickly and just stand to my right, we would like you to be introduced. And if you could state your name and which high school you represent in our Gilbert community. And I will just, a little bit closer here, I think from a camera angle, and I think the camera will be able to pick you up. I'll just start. Right here, please. I'm Elise Cervantes from Mesquite High School. I'm Catherine Chippo from Highland High School. I'm Peyton Mahoney from Gilbert Classical Academy. I'm Jacob Pam from Williamsfield High School. I'm Jackson Gissel from Williamsfield High School. I'm Bailey Herbstreit from Williamsfield High School. I'm Rachel Stowers and I'm homeschooled. I'm Courtney Stowers and I'm homeschooled. I'm Taylor Templeton from Gilbert High School. I'm Paige Garner from Highland High School. I'm Haley Overson from Highland High School. I'm Brandon Horneman from Mesquite High School. I'm Colton Cottle from Gilbert High School. I'm Ariana Rodriguez from Higley High. And I'm Connor McGettigan from Gilbert Classical Academy. Tonight's community gathering is sponsored by our Mayor's Youth Advisory Council to my right. Let's give them a big round of applause. <laughs> oh, you can clap for yourself, too. <laughs> Thank you. You're all invited to get back to your seats except for one. Elise, you can stay here. To introduce our speaker tonight, one member of our Mayor's Youth Advisory Council, Elise Cervantes from Mesquite High School, will be the one to do the introduction, and then our special guest will come forward. And I understand that at the end there will be some questions and answers, and some who are here might be asking those questions. If not, it might be some of the typical questions that you could ask that you could just bring up and, and uh, respond to. Elise, please. Okay. Okay. Our amazing speaker for tonight is Stephanie Siete. Stephanie is a the Director of Public Relationships for Community Bridge Bridges. She's an expert prevention trainer on drugs, trained trends and resources, resources, spending the majority of her time educating the public about the realities of drug abuse. Stephanie is dedicated to working with services, providers, uh, probation officers, the public and private health sectors, local colleges and universities, as well as local businesses. Stephanie Siete holds a degree in health education and mass communications. She graduated from Illinois State University with dual bachelor, bachelor degrees in 1999 and became a nationally, nationally recognized certified health education specialist that same year. Stephanie has been with the community Bridges since 2002. She began, with, began her work with a, with a prevention specialist in Valley Schools and mo soon moved into a role of community outreach speaking to students, parents, teachers, and administrations in the school districts and colleges. She continues to train trained police department, fire stations, corporate sites, and crisis volunteers on drug trends, signs, and symptoms, and drug conce concealments. Stephanie is res respected speaker on drug preventions in the Valley as 
has, she has also spoken at large scale venues, national school resources officers com conferences, AZ school research officers conference, AZ drug court conference, and frequently does interviews with NBC, ABC, Fox, and AZ family Sun channel three. Stephanie has also been a part of the North Valley, Northeast Valley Coalition Against Meth Amphetamines since its creation in April 2006. She serves in a leadership role in the steering community, committee and co-chairs the committee, community education subcommittee. She was an instructor for steering committee in, and the co-chair health science course at Paradise Valley Community College in 2007 through 08. She recently featured in the AZ State Crystal Darkness documentary and provide hundreds of hours of volunteer time to the project. Stephanie is also a current member of Women, and Women of Scottsdale Networking Group. Stephanie is passionately involved in preventing substance abuse, abuse but also enjoys spending time with her dog, rollerblading, and traveling. Here's Stephanie. Like, who is she talking about? Oh, that's me. Um, that's a little dated, but thank you guys for attending tonight. You know, that sounds a lot of repetition, talking about drugs, and I feel like sometimes people think when it comes to issues about substance abuse or drugs, they think they know it. But I'll give myself a little bit of credit. I've been doing this for 12 years, and the most common response I tend to hear is, oh my gosh, I thought I knew, and then I heard you speak. So I knew that I would have youth with me today as well as adults. So I, this is kind of a challenge that I'm going to try to present to both of you um, on different levels. And the reality is I'm going to be real direct, real quick, maybe spend 40 minutes with you guys telling you about the latest trends and things that are happening right here in Arizona, uh, around the world as well, because we can't keep our blinders on. We need to know what's coming our way. So if you guys have questions, as the mayor had said, um, towards the end you could ask, but at the same time, I'm willing to take questions during, just wave your hand at me and I'd be happy to answer your questions so everybody can hear it on the broadcast tonight. So that said, I just threw a lot of these together today because I knew we were limited on time. You know, in the opening there, you heard that I spoke um, for our college. I had a semester of time to talk about drugs and I ran out of time. So this is gonna be a real quick overview just to give you that perspective. Okay, for the parents that are attending tonight, you know, that's the number one question parents always want to ask is, when should I start talking to my kid about drugs? And they tend to kind of freak out a little when I tell them five, five years old. Now, this doesn't mean I would sit down a five-year-old child and say, so, crystal methamphetamine. Probably not the opener, right? You might, though, think about this, even from you guys' perspective, the, the teens that are here, any of you have younger brothers, sisters, nephews, neighbors, cousins that you think about, care about? Don't you think it's appropriate maybe at five years old to talk to a kid about vitamins and pills? Could, couldn't they take too many vitamins out of the cabinet or take too many prescription pills? Those are the kind of conversations we're talking about. The parents that are here thinking even bigger, if you go, oh my gosh, I didn't talk to my kid at five, five year plan. How old is your child right now? What do you want them to know five years from now? Is it about drugs or violence or bullying or sexting? Have that talk now. Start early, start often. You know, I show you guys this before I even give you the answer in this big slide about push them towards their passion. I feel like no matter who I'm speaking to, whether it be teenagers, adults, police officers, or parents, we all have something that we enjoy or are passionate about in our life. And if we don't, we need to. Because according to recent statistics, the number one reason that young people try drugs is that they're bored. I will tell you guys, you know, teenagers now, if you have boredom, enjoy it, because in adult world, 
I don't have that scheduled. I don't have time for boredom. But what I mean is I fill my time with the things that I value and love. I love my job. I'm happy to be here. But as you heard in that opener too, I'd probably be at the gym or hanging out with my dogs if I wasn't here. There are other things that I look forward to. And even if you guys can't think long term in terms of, you know, who do you want to be when you grow up? Maybe it's a place that you want to travel. Maybe it's like when you look at that five-year-old kid and you see they love to color. Maybe they like art. Get them involved. Think about your little brother or sister. Maybe they are like me. They like animals. They can volunteer at a clinic so that they don't get bored and at 13 years old, put a pill in their mouth. Take an unknown substance that we're gonna talk about tonight, things like spice, bath salts, all these new designer drugs. So that's what I mean when I say push them towards their passion. Get them involved in things that they love. Love, love your life, you've only got one of them. I think a lot of the times people take that for granted. They feel young, they feel invincible, they feel like things can't knock them down or hurt them. Life is, it's not a given. You know, there's no guarantees. Enjoy every moment. At the same time, for the parents that are in this room, I always talk about your impact. You know, a lot of the times there is crisis. There are family situations, death, divorce, what have you. And maybe a kid down the street's going through that and your son or daughter wants to invite them over for dinner. That's a big deal to have family time and family connectiveness. Like to be connected, to talk, that's huge. So just be aware of the power that you all have by being good people and loving yourself and others. For the parents, I think it's important to recognize that we need to model good behavior for our teenagers because teen behavior is strongly associated with parent behavior and expectations. I mean, bottom line, I'm not gonna read these things to you guys, I'm gonna explain them, but I always feel like even for my world, my adult life, I wanna live high standards, high values, high expectations for myself. If we have parents out there that think their kids are gonna do drugs, oh, it's just a little weed, oh, it's just a little alcohol, I'm sorry parents, but that's what you're gonna get. If that's all you expect, that's what you'll get. At the same time, I'll tell you right now, in this country, the average age to start drinking is 12.5. What's the legal age? Reminder, remind me, 21. We always talk about with teenagers, brain development is ongoing till around the age of 25. You're still learning through life experiences, your brain and connectivity, right? I mean, it just makes sense. As you age, you gain life experiences. If that is forming and developing up until the age of 25, cut that in half. 12.5 wins when kids start drinking. So halfway to the brain's ability to reach its potential, we're destroying it. So even if the parents don't have high standards and expectations, you can see how I talk to teenagers, just like you're my peer, like you're my friend, like you're an adult, you need to have them for yourself. We need to live better lives. I mean, I always tell people, wouldn't it be amazing in a year if I came back and told you the average age to start drinking was 15? As dumb as that sounds, it makes sense. It would mean that kids were waiting. Kids were waiting to engage in risky behavior. So just keep in mind, you guys, some of the things you see in the media, you know, I, I don't sugarcoat things. I don't talk about old things. I talk about current things. You see on the news, you see it on television, you see it in the magazines, who's doing what. And if our families aren't loving us, being connected and talking to each other, this is where we're gonna get our norms and values. It's not normal to get wasted, to talk about how much drug use, like Charlie Sheen talked about that, you know what I mean? Some of you remember seeing stuff like that. For the parents in this room, I feel like the kids are gonna make more sense of this. Miley Cyrus, that song that she sings, what's that about? Does anyone know when she's referencing Molly, what that's about? It's a song about drugs. And if you don't know that, you know, that's what I'm saying. That's what our teens are listening to. These are the modeled behavior that they're getting from celebrities. We need to be highly involved as, as families and with our kids. If you guys have questions, like I said, I'm moving really fast because there's so many things I want to talk about. And I'm going to end up talking about some things that are completely, as I say, negative and sad, talking about the devastation tied to drugs. But before I do all that, I'm putting out the positives. I'm putting out the opportunities of community. You know, it's, you've heard that saying, everyone's heard it, that it takes a village to raise a kid. It's more than mom and dad. You know, I think about my grandparents, the influence that they had, you know, how I am as a neighbor to my friend's kids. 
coaches, counselors, officers, pastors, employers. Just keep in mind all these caps that we wear and the influence we have on everyone. It's not just about your individual child, it's about our community. And this is something I see some of you taking photos and taking notes. Uh, this is a great one I tell everyone to write down or remember because this is one of my favorite resources. It's called CASA Family Day. CASA, the Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse. Family Day was this initiative that was signed into office in 2001 with the idea of families who eat together communicate more. Families who spend time together throughout the week they communicate, they talk, they reduce the high-risk behaviors of things like drugs, like bullying and violence. You know, think about it in terms of example. Imagine that mom and dad didn't have time for you till Thursday, and there was a big fight on campus on Monday, there was a big Facebook slam on Tuesday, and on Thursday they're like, hey, how was your week? How was today? How was today? And you've already forgotten all these other things that have gone down. Do you see what I'm saying, why it's important to connect on a daily basis? beyond Facebook, right? Face-to-face -face is pretty important. So casafamilyday.org, it's huge because it has fun things like family meal planners, recipes. Hey, I even look on there for ideas. It's fun stuff, it's fun stuff. And then also like great questions to ask, big conversations, big difference between what you're asking someone who's eight versus 12 versus 17. All right, let's get into the heart of drugs here. I, again, forewarn you, this is going to be a little overwhelming, so I've edited a little bit here. But how have times changed? Let's do that for the first five minutes. People tend to think still these are the three most prevalent drugs of abuse. Alcohol, tobacco or cigarettes, and marijuana. Keep in mind that prescription drugs are now considered gateway drugs. How many of you, just by raise of hands, I mean, I just like to know for participation that you know someone that's abused pills? taken pills, not just for, you know, for medicine, but they've taken them to try to feel better. Anyone? Yeah, I saw a couple of hands go up there. And again, you're not going to get in trouble for this stuff. I'm just validating what I know, that prescription pills are as common of a drug to try when you're in middle school as a cigarette, marijuana, or alcohol. But how have those products changed? Especially for the parents or the adults in this room, you really need to take note of how these products are different. Before we go there, I love my warning sign, because I must say this 10 times a presentation, so probably 100 times a day, <laughs> that legal does not mean safe. I mean, I'm backing up already. Look at the drugs that people use as children. Most of them are legal. I'm going to tell you, and I'll say it right now, because it's so important to hear it, for the first time in history in this country, we have more drug deaths every year than we do from car crashes. Do you get what I'm saying that legal does not mean safe? When I tell you what those deaths are from, most of them are from our legal drugs. So please don't let anyone ever fool you to thinking, well, it's legal, you won't get in trouble. It's not about trouble, it's about you, your bodies getting hurt, not just hurting yourselves. Who else will you hurt if you leave this world because of certain drugs? Let's talk about some of those new ones. Energy drinks, pretty popular? Yeah, see all of a sudden the heads are bobbing because I know I'm talking to teenagers. Hey, I have long days too. I understand the popularity of caffeine. However, keep in mind that energy drinks are so much different than sodas. You know, you're basically seeing like heart palpitations and seizures and strokes in children because some of these energy drinks contain four to five times more soda or more caffeine than a soda does. You know, and a lot of people will just have this for lunch and they call it lunch or they call it breakfast. You guys just understand what this potentially could do to you, especially when you're building up tolerance and your heart is beating too fast from these things. You can actually have a heart attack. Now I realize we're more on a broadcast so I can't get everyone to participate. That's why you guys are here in the audience. I'm gonna ask you a few questions. Looking at this slide in front of you, these are not just energy drinks. Some of these drinks contain alcohol. What I want to know is which ones. What contains alcohol right there? And how would you know is the bigger question. Anybody? Anyone want to shout one out? Actually, a lot of people always say all of them, some of them. 
The liquid nitro, it sounds like it might, right? I mean, just based on the names. Let's actually look at the answer. That one doesn't. The ones with arrows contain alcohol. I'm going to show the parents in this room because you especially want to know this. How would you recognize that? Maybe you heard in my bio that I'm also a former college instructor. Well, I had kids in front of me that were over 21 years of age and they'd bring in their energy drinks. And I'd walk that room trying to figure out does that one have alcohol or not? It's very, very hard to look at the top of a can and try to see a tiny percentage. Let's talk about that percentage for a minute. This is just pure education for everyone here. The average can of beer contains about 4% alcohol. Keep that in mind. The average energy drink, if it's got alcohol, contains anywhere from 8 to 12% alcohol. I see the reactions because if you think about it, it's like a bottle of wine mixed with a pot of coffee. It's very, very dangerous mixing these two. How do you know if you don't see that tiny percentage? Here's what you're looking for. You're looking for this supplement list, or you know, you know on the side of a can, if anyone, I don't think you're supposed to bring anything in here, but imagine like a, a soda can or an iced tea can. You know what I'm talking about. You, the girls do, right? We always look for the calories and the sugar. <laughs> a few laughs. You look and read those things. Parents, that's important because if you see that label, it's not alcohol. It's not alcohol. If you don't see that label, that's a reason to pick up that can a little closely and investigate it. Look for the percentage. Does that make sense? So again, I'm trying to go back and forth in terms of information for both of you guys. But at the same time, I feel like everyone could always use a little extra education on the drug thing. For example, taking a, pic taking a look at this picture, you can see all the different cans, bottles, odd shaped things that look like nail polish. All of those products, that's alcohol. That's how alcohol has changed visually nowadays. Now it might sound like a foreign language. I'm gonna say a lot of words that sound foreign tonight. One of them starting here, nomination. Anyone seen this on TV recently? Talk about current events. This was the lead story on CNN less than 10 days ago. Lead story because now with social media, as I've talked about why we need to more, be more engaging face-to-face -face as opposed to online, Social media is currently encouraging people to slam alcohol and nominate a friend to do it too. They do this, they video it, they post it, and sometimes they're chugging bottles of liquor. Do you know how dangerous that is? The reports are talking about how five people have already died. And that's just the reports that we know of. So someone's actually doing this and asking you to do it and post your video. Please don't ever feel like you have to do that. You see already why I said to love yourself enough, to be involved, to be passionate about things that aren't high risk behavior like something like this, which is already proven to be deadly. E-cigarettes. I think a lot of people think, well, tobacco, well, cigarettes, it's a product that you light. We've come so far now that we have battery operated devices that turn nicotine and other chemicals, keywords there, into a vapor that you inhale. You know, I read that definition to you because I want you to think about that. Who knows whether a vapor or smoke is safer? Anybody? I don't even know that answer. The FDA doesn't even know that answer. They haven't touched it yet. So maybe they're making it seem like, oh, it doesn't smell as nasty as smoke. It doesn't mean the vapors aren't filled with chemicals as well. So you're putting in a liquid nicotine into here. I wonder if anyone's ever thought about liquid nicotine and the danger of it. Because I'll tell you right now, say a child, say a toddler picks up that liquid nicotine that's supposed to go in mommy or daddy's e-cigarette and they put it in their mouth. They will overdose and die immediately. Nicotine is potent and powerful. In an actual cigarette, it's such a minimal little dose that people use. And this is a liquid form that in the wrong hands will cause death. We have a lot of concerns with this product and we do not have research behind it. Vaping, other chemicals, think about that. Because again, I'm not here to teach anybody about how to do this, I'm here to enlighten all of you about things that are new and what we don't even know. We don't even know the dangers of this stuff. Anyone ever heard of BHO? Butane honey oil? Butane hash oil? 
Now, if I ask the question of who knows what marijuana is, all the hands go up. This is the newest form of marijuana. If I have adults in this room that are teachers, parents, anyone, I mean, really, all of us should be concerned about this. This is me introducing to you how you might overlook the newest form of marijuana because it's no longer a baggie full of pot. It might be a little Carmex container. It might be a little lotion container. It's so easy to hide it because it looks like a gooier honey substance the way this stuff is created. They're actually putting butane through it and cooking it. Another dangerous concern, this is like a mini meth lab. And again, I know I'm talking to mostly teenagers, but you guys don't have to be drug experts to understand meth labs were dangerous, right? They blew up. They didn't just hurt the people in one home, they hurt a whole community or a block because it was poisonous, toxic chemicals. Well, now we've got people cooking marijuana. And again, we're here in Arizona. I want to tell you about Arizona events and, and things that have happened. We just had a butane honey or hash oil explosion a few weeks ago in a vehicle at a gas station. Exactly. Somebody was producing this in a car at a gas station and it blew up. We have to be careful in terms of you know, how it's produced, but at the same time, why you, most of you are probably asking, why would someone make this? Because then they get a stronger marijuana substance. So again, you guys heard me, heard, heard that I speak at all different venues. Sometimes we explain to the officers and the firefighters, you might get a call on a head trauma, and it could be tied to this. How so? Because this is so potent that when, when someone smokes it, they pass out and hit their heads. There's been very dangerous long-term effects from this new form of marijuana known as butter, shatter, wax, dabs. Those are some of the names. And I can't, you know, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't explain to the teenage audience how dangerous it is to smoke pot. I already said in the first few minutes of this that you need to understand you know, it's not just a waste of time here in class. I mean, I, I really want you guys to think about, like, life, the brain development. You know, you won't just graduate high school and be done with growing and thinking. You know, if you go to college, you still have this opportunity. If you get into the field of work, you're growing through life experiences, right? Okay, all of that said, there was a brand new study that came out that commented on teens who routinely smoked marijuana suffered from a lower IQ later in life. They risk a long-term drop in their IQ. And this mental decline was seen only in those who started smoking before they turned age 18. So what we're saying is, remember just a little bit ago I said drinking is starting at 12.5 and I'm trying to push it back? Marijuana use is starting around 12 and 13 and I'm trying to push it back only because I want to help you guys out. I'm not kidding. I think the controversial thing is, oh my gosh, medical marijuana. Unless you're in a state of pain or death, there's really no study that says marijuana is good for your brain. If you actually watch documentaries about medical marijuana, they even say that smoking marijuana during teen years and critical brain development years is dangerous. I mean, look at a job like mine. Some of the words I've already used, it takes a lot of brain power. Do you know what I'm saying? To do this, you want to be smarter and wiser. You don't want to make yourself dumber because of some of these drugs that they're throwing the word medicine in front of. And again, I'm not saying that it's not medicinal. In some cases, it does stimulate appetite and AIDS and cancer patients. You know, sometimes if someone's got cancer and going through chemo and they take the medicinal form of this, I mean, they're so sick it might make them throw up less. You gotta think about where they're at already. It's not a replacement for, for anything. It's just in certain people and certain patients. But on the flip side, like I said, it can hurt your brain, heart, and lungs if you're just using it recreationally for fun. All right, so see what I'm saying right off the bat, how the drugs have changed? I mean, I could end the presentation now and I feel like a lot of you are already shaking your heads going, wow. Things are different. Here in 2014, it's different. Well, 
Here's one of our biggest problems we face in the world right now, and especially in this country. It's the prescription pill epidemic. Prescription drug abuse is the nation's fastest growing drug problem. We have so many people being admitted into the ER regularly. We have overdose deaths on pain relievers that have surpassed the deaths of heroin and cocaine combined. A lot of you've heard about heroin probably because it's been in the news. That actor Corey Monteith died last summer, the guy from Glee. I know a lot of you relate to that one. And maybe some of you saw that Philip Seymour Hoffman died. I mean, he's a little older, but I want to point something out. It was a lifelong battle. No one's immune to this. Corey was 31. Philip Seymour Hoffman was 46. I have a friend who lost her boyfriend when he was 17 years old. He died. No one's immune to this. Why am I talking about heroin so much right now? Heroin's popular, yet we still have more deaths from prescription painkillers than heroin and cocaine combined. Every day, 2,700 teens are trying prescription drugs for the first time. You know, a decade ago, that number was about cigarettes. We were saying, oh my gosh, 3,000 kids a day are trying cigarettes. We are at the lowest rate of teen smoking ever right now. But the drugs just switched. Now it's prescription pills. Here I was telling you guys a little bit ago that I wanted to cover some of these numbers, so let's just jump into them as opposed to me like giving you little basic facts. Because I really, really want you to take a moment to look at this screen. This is one of the most important slides you're going to look at today. So it says opioids. What I'm talking about in this category are the pain relievers that you've heard of, right? Oxycontin, Percocet, Percodin, some of those ones out there. They are increasing the numbers of deaths that we're seeing. Now, this might be a little confusing. Go to the middle. Do you guys see where it says 16,849? What that means is back in 1999, which is not that long ago, in 1999, almost 17,000 people died in a year because of drugs. Look next to it. Ten years later, that number was up over 20,000. 37,000 people died in 2009 because of drugs. That was not a fluke. That was not a random year. Because if you look at the number above it, in 2010, we had over 38,000 people. We are on our way of approaching 40,000 people every year dying because of drugs. Scroll down a little below that, you guys. It says 4,000 people died in 99 from opioids. Almost 16,000 died in 2009 from opioids. The last point on the screen, 60% of our drug overdose deaths involve pharmaceuticals. Does legal mean safe? Not at all. You know, I'm not here to um, convince you of anything, waste anyone's time, tell you what to do. It's not my job. It's here to give you facts, to get you to think about reality. You know, we are seeing so many people use pills properly, but then steal pills, pass pills around at the schools. They get into hands, inappropriate hands, and just because they're legal does not make them safe at all. Who's doing this stuff? One in four of our teenagers, that's you guys, are saying that they've used prescription pills. Of those kids that say they do it, one in five start before they turn age 14. If you know someone thinking about it, I'm going to explain to you what the causes of death are here in a moment. You might want to have a conversation with them. More than a quarter of our teenagers, they believe that prescription drugs are safer than street drugs. Now again, I go back to teen brain. Here's where you guys almost get to have an excuse. Your brain isn't developed in all the way. How would you know? But at the same time, for the parents in this room, what excuse do they have, right? <laughs> they don't. And what's my point? One in six parents believes prescription drugs are safer than street drugs. Take your eyes down to the third point on that screen. One in five of our parents, they're giving their kids prescription drugs that aren't prescribed for them. Just because it came from a doctor and it's clean from a lab does not make it safe. Mark my words, if I laid Oxycontin on the table next to heroin and I broke apart the molecular structure, they'd be nearly identical. They're interchangeable highs. As you can see just from some of the charts here, what's popular, anything. 
everything from pharmaceutical drugs to street drugs. Given alcohol is not included in this list because that's always number one, everything is, is popular. On this next slide, you're going to see the impact. This is not, this is, you guys, this is not a presentation about teenagers. I think most of you get that. This is a presentation about the problems in our community that involve drugs. Those little red charts on the bottom, those little red graphs, basically show you from year to year the increase in drugged driver activity, drug impaired drivers in our communities. Not to scare you, but I'm really getting you to focus about our lives. When you get in a car tonight and drive home, you put your lives at risk because other people are driving their cars impaired with drugs and alcohol, things like synthetic drugs, which we're going to talk about right now, prescription pills that impair their ability to drive a car. Before we talk about some of those drugs, I want to take a moment to reiterate, you guys, and I didn't say it because I knew I was limited on time, but you have to hear this. I'm telling you about all the numbers of death. You know, so we're starting to see these events where we collect drugs um, on a regular basis, like we're collecting them and taking them back and incinerating them. We're doing this because of the frequency of use, because of the frequency of death. I promised you I would explain to you how people are dying. The number one cause of death when using these opioids is respiratory failure. They just stop breathing. Most people go to bed permanently. Again, I'm going to use sad examples of someone like Corey Monteith who was found on his hotel floor dead. Philip Seymour Hoffman who was found on his bathroom floor dead. Whether it's pills, whether it's needles, whether it's snorted, whether it's smoked, it gets into the body, it gets into the breathing, and it slows it down. We always say these people are doped out. They're calm, they're relaxed, they're euphoric. Their breathing is suppressed. They go to sleep and many of them never wake up again. Whether it's the pills, whether it's the heroin. If you keep putting more and more into your body, that's very dangerous. So we're starting to host these venues where you collect drugs. But one thing I really want to point out is here in Arizona, we have med return boxes. That almost looks like a glorified mailbox, doesn't it? But these boxes are located in police stations every day. You can walk in and dispose of your prescription medication properly. And when I say properly, it's because people in the past have, put, have flushed it down the toilet and that's poisoning our water systems. So if you want to know more about stuff like this, medreturn.com would be a great website. Thank you. Would be a great website. I guess the whole point is, you guys, I don't want to, again, just tell you, like I said, all the sad things. I want to tell you the response, what our community is doing to fight the problem. And a lot of you, you know, I heard your ages, you're older, going into college, thinking about your careers and your adulthood and your passions. If you have any interest in a job like mine, I mean, think about the opportunities that are out there. There's an opportunity to help and change those numbers. So heroin, I'm going to get through this quickly because I'm going to show you this. Now that you understand that people stop breathing, I think it's important to look at the numbers. And I don't have to read that to you. I want you guys to look at from the 80s till today how strong heroin has become. We've gone from single digit purity to nearly 100% pure heroin floating around in our communities. What does that mean? That means you've got a good shot at dying or becoming physically addicted the first time you ever touch this stuff. These are some of the faces that we've lost. These are some of the faces that are celebrities that we've lost. I know people that live here in Arizona that are gone that you might not recognize, but I wanted to show you some of the faces that are gone from this earth way too early. Now given, like I said, Corey was 31, I believe River Phoenix, yes, 23. I want to talk about Philip Seymour Hoffman at 46 and the bigger impact that he left. He started abusing drugs in his teens and 20s. He got clean and sober in his early 20s. And he relapsed. You guys know what that means, right? He picked up the habit again. He relapsed. So dead at the age of 46, he's been battling this his whole life. He's found dead on a bathroom floor with a needle in his arm. His three young children were waiting for their father to come pick him up. 
I want to remind you that drug use is selfish. People make decisions for themselves, but they hurt so many others when they leave this earth. What's crazy is when he died that same week, there was this bad batch, not that there's any good batches, but a, what they meant is a really bad mix of heroin hitting the East Coast. Some of you might have heard about this. It was heroin-laced fentanyl. Now, fentanyl is 100 times stronger than morphine. It's used in extreme cancer conditions to help someone near the end of their life. My point is this. Someone sells you a baggie of drugs, a little bag of heroin. Does it have a label? Does it have the ingredients? Does it say what country it came from? In this case, it was laced with another substance and 22 people died within a week from touching it. Here in Arizona, we average 100 people in a year dying from heroin. They lost 22 in a week. You get the point. You never know what you're taking. Look at these pills. A lot of these pills look like ecstasy. And for some crazy reason, people think ecstasy is safe. People think it's no big deal. It's a party drug. It's a feel-good drug. You guys, that's not ecstasy. That's heroin in Canada. There was two individuals who were manufacturing uh, heroin. They had all these research chemicals that they ordered off the internet. And they bought a pill press, and they were making this. And you guys, it was 40 times stronger than the heroin in our country. People were dying immediately. Do you get my point about you never know? Because that one's got like the little F or Facebook logo on it. It looks like ecstasy, but it was not at all. So don't ever feel the pressure to take something that you don't know what it is, even if it looks like candy or pills. Because of time, I'm going to move really quickly and just tell you this is a new concerning drug that's in our community. It looks like spice, and it's being sold at some of our smoke shops, and it's a drug called Kratom. There have been overdoses tied to it. Uh, it's legal, but what did I already say? It's almost like I should wear the shirt, right? Legal doesn't mean safe. So just because it's legal doesn't mean it's safe. It's a new drug that's being smoked. Some of the reason I put these ones in here is not to confuse you. It's, as I always say, to heighten your awareness. Something called 2-5-I N-bomb, it killed two kids in Scottsdale who were 18 years old. One of them was currently going to ASU. One of them was a high school senior. They took this synthetic LSD, or drops. You can put it in your nose, put it on your tongue, or put it in food. I'm not exactly sure how they did it, but they immediately died. I will tell you that one of the boys that died, his friends, again, teen brain, they freaked out. They didn't know what to do. They put their friend in the backseat of the car and put the windows down and drove around thinking fresh air would wake him up. After a while, when he didn't wake up, they gave him milk, thought it was like poison. Their third option was the hospital when the doctors said, you should have came here first. He's been dead for a while. Unknown substances, you guys. This one is legal as well. Now I feel like I kind of said this, but let's see who's listening. Who's Molly? Who is Molly? What is Molly? Do you guys ever hear that reference in music? The kids always say yes. The adults in this room, take note, listen to your music, listen. There's always Molly references. And a lot of people think Molly is ecstasy because Molly is short for molecule. And a lot of times you'll hear it being a molecule of E or ecstasy. And someone like Miley Cyrus did go on Rolling Stone magazine and proclaim that drugs like cocaine were bad and stupid, but that Molly was a fun dance drug. I'm going to tell you right now, there's been so many deaths tied to Molly pills that been, when it's been run through the lab for forensics to test it, it's never come back as just ecstasy. Here in Arizona, all of our cases have come back as a mixture. Some cases, a lot of cases, something called bath salts, which I'm about to explain to you. Some other states have seen methamphetamine and heroin cut. What is Molly? The reason I have the word anything? It's a slang term for a cool looking, fun looking pill that could be mixed with anything. It's just a slang term. 
and it's getting misrepresented as fun. The reality is I think it's dangerous. So let's talk for the last few slides here about some of those synthetics that I just mentioned. Spice. How many of you have heard of spice? Just by raise a hand, yes? At this point, almost everyone's heard of it, right? Because it's been in the news and we've had a lot of incidents in our schools. I almost want to make everyone say this 10 times out loud. Spice is not marijuana. It's not. It looks like it, but it's not. It's synthetic. I'll tell you exactly where it came from, but keep in mind, it's just basically dried herbs or plant material that's sprayed with research chemicals. Hundreds of chemicals. Chemicals that we don't know anything about. I'm going to tell you a story here in a second. Before I do, let me just explain something behind JWH. If you were to pick up a package of spice, it might say it contains JWH chemicals. Most people go, well, what is that? It's a person. John W. Huffman was a professor at Clemson University. He was asked to study the effects of marijuana on the human brain. So he began his research and studies. Somewhere along the lines in his study, he was also asked to not use the marijuana and create substitute chemicals to study. Doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, does it? So he made chemicals, he tied them to his name and used his initials, he made 400 of them and he sprayed them on a plant. And I'm telling you right now, people assumed it would be like marijuana. The effects of this stuff turned out to be nothing like marijuana. We started to see that it hurt a lot of people um, all over their bodies. You guys can look up here and see the different effects, but I will tell you, heart rate goes up, temperature goes up, blood pressure goes up, the gag reflex kicks in, there's a lot of vomiting associated with this. You know, does any of this sound like marijuana when I tell you their heart rate is going out of control and crazy and that they're throwing up and they're hallucinating and they're seeing things? Kidney failure. They're questioning whether this does cause kidney failure. Panic attacks, heart attacks from a legal substance. Let me expand a little bit more here, have you guys look up at the slide, and I'll tell you some stories. This happened in Phoenix a little over a year ago. Again, I keep telling you this is not a kid problem, it's a community problem. We had a 29-year-old man in Phoenix call 911 on himself. Why? Because he smoked spice and he hallucinated. He called 911 and said, please help. I have an 18-month-old daughter. She is beaten, bloodied, bruised, fat lip. Someone beat her up and I think it was me. I smoked spice, I hallucinated, I don't remember anything. I'm the only one in this apartment. I had to have done it. Does that sound like marijuana? I've had students report to me through a task force that I see on synthetic drugs that this has made them feel panic attacks and paranoia like you couldn't believe. One of the students explained when he walked into the building at school, he felt like everyone was looking at him, staring at him, talking about him, and he freaked out. For everyone in this room, I think school safety, violence, and weapons is a huge concern, correct? How safe are we? We need to factor in that many of these synthetic drugs are creating mental illness immediately. You would not want a weapon in the hands of someone who smoked, as they're calling it, synthetic marijuana, and it's not and starts to freak out that you're looking at them, talking about them, and staring at them. Do you see why it's so important to make good decisions and stay away from some of these very unknown substances? Here's where I'm gonna relate a story to you guys. This is not tested. You can raise your hands and ask me questions about what is this gonna do in the future, and I'm gonna tell you right now, my answer would be, I don't know. It's a brand new drug, it's only been out for so long. You know, they test these drugs and then they think that they know about them, right? Let me introduce you to a drug that was tested in the 1950s and marketed all over the world. And I'm going to tell you what happened 10 years later. It's a drug called thalidomide. Back in the 1950s, this drug seemed through testing to alleviate nausea and vomiting, and it helped people sleep better. So it seemed like the perfect drug to prescribe to pregnant women 
This drug was marketed in 46 countries. It was not available in the United States. Women fought for it here because they wanted to sleep and not get sick while they were pregnant. Four years after this drug's been on the market, they question it. Ten years after it's out there, they confirm it. This drug has caused deformities, birth defects, shortened limbs, brain damage, heart damage, deafness, blindness, shortened limbs, and all these children that are born, and many children that are never born because of all the miscarriages, because of a tested drug that mommy took. Do you get where I'm going with this? The people who use synthetic drugs today, do they know what's gonna happen in the future? Do you, do I? No one knows, do you understand the risks, the gambles and the chances that people are taking with all these unknown substances? Full circle, do you understand why I want you to be passionate, loving, connected with your family and make good decisions? This stuff is scary to even someone like me who's been in this field for 12 years. We've never seen anything like this till recent years and we do not have the answers. We do not know how to treat this. We do not know how to stop this. The last three slides here are just showing you people are doing it. Spice, in 2010, 11,406 people were hospitalized. And these are just the individuals who went to the hospital. 75% of those people were between 12 and 29 years old, very young. One year later, we went from 11,000 to 28,531 hospitalized from using legal unknown drug called Spice. Salvia, just to point it out, is not safer. I've seen a lot of this in the news. I mean, even if you guys, it's sad, and I'm sorry to bring up such tragic events, but if you were to look at the Jared Lautner case, you know, us being Arizonans, what happened in Tucson with that shooting, they do question salvia use. A couple years ago, even Miley Cyrus posted videos saying it was no big deal, it was legal. We don't know anything about these plants that people are smoking. We do know that they've been used in religious ceremonies and purposes for a long time, but when people start abusing products, they can hallucinate, have out-of-body experiences, and harm themselves. Last drug I'm gonna talk about here as I break into it is gonna be bath salts. But as I get there, I want you to look at this slide and these code words. The synthetic drugs that we're wrapping up talking about tonight are not sold as drugs. They're selling them as potpourris, as incense, fertilizers and insect repellents and bath salts. Little quick participation from you guys. Fill in the, word, fill in the blank for me when the drug field. If I say crystal, crystal what? Everyone says crystal meth, that's not hard to understand. Crystal, glass, ice, glassy, crystally sounding stuff for a lot of times they do that up their nose. Bath salts is the same kind of slang term. All that is, bath salts is just a slang term for a drug called cathinone. A cathinone is a psychoactive, psychoactive substance, acts like a stimulant, and it's found in that plant in the corner, that cot plant. Again, you guys, I like to relate to current events. Watch Captain Phillips. Watch Black Hawk Down. They're chewing on these plants that make them awake and alert and give them stimulant, right? That's that plant. Then they mix it with other chemicals, and along comes a drug called bath salts. That's not illegal, that we don't know anything about, that's causing all these awful effects. To summarize, a drug like cocaine might keep someone up Saturday night, 90 minutes effects. You know, they feel like, oh my gosh, one crazy night, evening. Methamphetamine, ecstasy, people might say all night effects. Oh my gosh, I watched the sun come up. It was crazy. I was up all night partying on a drug. Heart rate's out of control. Temperatures, they get sick. They hallucinate. Then along comes bath salts, and it keeps people feeling these effects for three to four days. Can you imagine if you were hallucinating and tripping out and seeing things that didn't exist and hearing voices in your head for three to four days? 12 hours go by and you can't snap out of it. 24 hours, 36 hours, 72 hours. As a result, 
We've actually seen people harm themselves, suicidal tendencies and threats, knives, weapons, guns, because they can't snap out of it. This is so new to our communities in the last few years that even the DEA sees this as an eminent threat to our public safety because people are under an influence consistently for days and newer reports are talking about some people are experiencing flashbacks and effects three to four months after they last used. I mean, you guys, let's, let's just talk quick reality. Some of you heard about these cannibalism type reports and things that have happened where another person's attacked another and it is what it is in Miami. A guy attacked someone and ripped his, chewed on his face, hallucinating, and they said they couldn't tie it to this drug. Well, even back then, they didn't have effective drug testing capabilities. We're just getting there now. So my point, you never know. You never know. When people are using drugs, they're taking chances and risks. You just gotta question, how much do you value yourself? What are you looking forward to that you wouldn't want something like this to get in the way of? Do you know what I mean? And again, if you guys can't think jobs, I know it's throwing job ideas at you, but think about like vacation. Where are you looking forward to going? You know what I mean? For, or, uh, for me, I go back, back to the dog thing, right? I want to adopt another one. I don't want things to get in that way. Think of all the things you love that you wouldn't want drugs to get in the way of. Last few things, I'll just show your names. Those are some of the names of these drugs that are out there. If somebody tries to offer you things that sound like bath products or cleansers, just be cautious and aware that it could be the basalt or the cathinones. And again, anyone that wants this PowerPoint, I'm happy to share this with you guys as well because there are some really great resources in here. I work for Community Bridges. CommunityBridgesAZ.org is our website. You can click on that and watch our YouTube channel, which shows some of the things I'm talking about. So you guys can share these videos with other people. Um, for the parents that are here, obviously TimeToTalk.org is a good one. And JoinTogether.org is my favorite. It's a great one for you, even for the students. Here, I'll help you with your homework. If you have to do any reports or anything, go to jointogether.org, put your email in. They send you the international news stories and studies about drugs all over the world. That's where I get all my knowledge, actually, is a lot of times from that bottom website. So it just helped you out. <laughs> and just some other resources. I always feel like this one grabs attention. WTF is not what you think it is why teens fail and what to fix. And I'm proud to say being here in Gilbert, a lot of the authors are from Gilbert, Arizona. This was a collaborative effort of teachers and counselors and principals and police officers and drug experts. We all co-authored a book and each chapter is a different topic, bullying, sexting, drugs, what have you. So sounds a little more exciting than the parent guide, right? WTF? <laughs> and then you guys can also check out Poison Control Center's got some great information. I'm happy to be a resource for you. I don't mind leaving you my contact information because I feel like I just said a lot in a short amount of time. But I'm going to ask one question, and I don't know if anyone else will see it, so this is just for my benefit. But by raise of hands, how many of you can comfortably, confidently say by attending tonight you learned something new, helpful, exciting, or beneficial? Anybody? That makes my day. So thank you for your time. Any questions? I mean, I said to ask throughout. You guys are entitled to ask, but at the same time, I know we're kind of pressed for time. Any questions that anyone would like to ask? And I also have one of our officers here, too, so I figured between the two of them, they could probably answer a lot of your questions about what's going on and kind of what we're seeing. So feel free to ask lots of questions. I like questions. Go for it. Go ahead. Oh, well, you're, we're going to make you say that again with a mic. My name is Carolyn Bunnett, and I was sent here by Mesa Baptist Church information. And, um, and, I, and I thank you for all the stuff that you've, you've done. It's great. I just wanted to know how I can get some of it on paper because I'm, I'm going to have a, a table 
just for this, what you just did. And, and I want information to empower parents because I deal with a lot of parents that just don't know what else to do, don't know what else to say, don't know who to talk to. And when you, you can't send them to some of the websites because they don't work. I mean, it's like they're chasing a ghost. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would just say I can give you some of the stuff, places that you can print, or if you and I want to talk afterwards, you can come to my office and I'll give you physical thing, handouts and materials. This PowerPoint as well. Anyone that's here wanted it, I would email it to you, and you could have those handouts. You could give those out as well in like a PDF or a PowerPoint format. Yeah. I mean, the websites are great, but that's why you know, another reason I told you guys about that Family Day website, because it's, I didn't mention this, but it does have, and I couldn't print it for everybody, a 30-page toolkit at casafamilyday.org of questions you can have family conversations about, recipes, meal planners, um, drug tips, and all, it's all in there. It's all in there. So we might just have to do the legwork and print it. Um, because at our church, we, we, we come on campus and we may have teams, and a lot of times they're from ASU, and they're just tripped out. I mean, they don't know where they are, they don't know what they're doing, and the only resource we've had has been community bridges. So, Aww, and you guys have you. really been very good, so thank you. We'd be happy to help you out again, thank you. And I, the thing is, I appreciate the honesty, because I think a lot of times in the community we wear blinders and try to ignore the problems. And the problems are right there in our backyards, you guys. So we need to do our efforts, as I say, our action steps. It's one thing to attend and learn like this, but what are you doing? Action steps about it. They're hosting events. You guys could be talking to your friends. Other questions? Everyone's so shy. Come on. Did I scare you that much? And I'm just going to back up and put this slide up here if you guys want to take pictures with your phone. There's a lot of resources right there in front of you if you have things that you need to look into. All those websites are great. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Bailey. Um, I'm a senior at Williamsville High School, which is a couple streets down and everything. Um, the hardest part is knowing that, you know, maybe it's a friend or an acquaintance that is, like, you know, doing a gateway drug, and you don't know exactly how to approach them. I think that's, like, the hardest part is, um, you know, do you just send them, you know, check this uh, website out, or do you, like, I, I don't know exactly how to ex approach them in that type of situation, because, you know, you do want to help them, yeah. knowing that they're going to be hurt in the future. So I think it's, like, something that, approaching them is the hardest part about it. Sure. I think between the two of us, we probably have some just real life examples that we can give, but I, and this is what I would say. I, where I work, we see it, but at the same time, I do a lot of the education in the schools. And just through life experience, I would say this. You would rather you made an effort than not. Do you know what I'm saying? Say something happens and that person gets hurt or dies. I mean, let's, let's go like the extreme. You might experience some guilt for not speaking up, but you would be better if you, if you did. You know what I'm saying? Here's my other thing. Who cares about facts? I mean, they're important. But you guys attend something like this to hear it. I, I'm not going to read things to you. I'm not going to give you a doctor talk and be too clinical. I shared stories with you. People remember stories. Be real. Be personable. You tell that person that's in your life if you care about them, let them know. This is why I'm telling you this, because I do care. I say that in my adult life. I've said that to, just to give an example, just smoking a cigarette. I've said that to some of my best girlfriends. If I didn't care, I wouldn't say anything to you. But I do care. This is why you shouldn't smoke. You have, and I 
you know, your children or, you know, I try to tell them. So speak from your heart would be my best example, um, best advice. You know, if you don't have all these facts memorized, I can help you. Um, but just speak from your heart. Speak up. Yeah, I think it would, just to jump on, Mike Angstead's my name, hi. Uh, um, I think the other thing that works well, because a lot of times I have a hard time talking with people, especially people that I know closely about this kind of stuff, because you feel like if you press them, maybe they're going to be, become even more defensive and it's going to shut them down. So you kind of, you want to softly talk about it. And it's hard because these, this is just tough stuff that you just have to grab them and tell them it's wrong. But um, I think um, like Stephanie was showing the, the picture of uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, it, a lot, for a lot of people, he was one of those actors and there's other ones that really moved you or moved a lot of people. You can like relate, like this person had a lot of talent and now they're dead. And you know, you can start a conversation with somebody about how tragic that is. And it just kind of breaks the ice because you're talking about somebody else. You're not specifically talking about them, although you know that they have the same problem. It's just uh, kind of a reality uh, check for them. Like, you know, this could happen to you. And hopefully it evolves into that kind of conversation. You can keep the dialogue going without shutting them down. It happened to a basketball player here right at Chandler High School. Straight A student dating a guy and of course he was doing drugs and eventually in her college career that's what she started doing. They, I don't know exactly what they were doing, we were never told, but it was drugs and he hallucinated, cut her up and he thought he had killed her so he committed suicide, killed himself. She actually lived, but her life is pretty messed up. And, and on, at, even at our church, so I'm not even going to the school, I'm standing at the church level. We have a lot of kids, and like she said, 12, 13 years old. Those are the kids that I'm talking to. Parents don't know what to do. Parents catching their kids under the bed using synthetic drugs. The kids are so strung out that it's like, I, I can't be seen, but you are seen. And it's really bad. That's why I'm here. And if you guys have heard nothing else tonight, I mean, I'm taking in kids, they're in college now, just the problem never got dealt with. Deal with it now, have a life. Like Stephanie said, you only have one, make it the best. And you don't have to do it through dialysis and or, or hope that's if you live, you know, yeah. or, or, or your family grieving for the rest of their life. And just to add on, you know, it, it's like a message for parents, it's a message for kids. Here's a message that's for the same for everybody. We always say to the parents, talk to your kids, and I just gave you the advice, talk to your friends. A lot of people fear the conversation because they don't know what to say, right? What am I going to say about drugs? Mom and dad are like, what am I going to say to my kid about drugs if I don't know? Get educated. You know, I know we go to school for a lot of things, and then we get out of school and get into our real life careers and things. We got to make it a priority to be educated, to engage in conversation, to care, to have the talk. I mean, again, it's hard for me to approach a good girlfriend of mine and kind of harp on her about smoking a cigarette. But I care, and I know my voice is important. Sir, yours. Any other last minute questions or comments? If not, you guys, I super, super appreciate you coming out, taking the time to listen to this. You know, and I really hope you leave here tonight and share some of these messages with other people. Peers, neighbors, friends, anybody. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you for everybody who's coming, or who came out tonight, and um, our great presentation by Stephanie. And thanks, Mike, for coming over, too. Um, you guys are free to go after I make one announcement. This is completely off topic. But since I have you here, I'm going to announce that our leadership summit, which when we were talking about great opportunities of learning leadership and getting people out of the house and giving them activities, this is a good one. Uh, Tuesday, April 15th from 6.30 to 8 o'clock here, and it's open to the public, um, high school age, so 14 and above. Um, parents are welcome to come to that, and it'll be um, here. We have a couple of great guest speakers that night, and then it'll just be focusing on leadership and, and how to become a better leader and how to become a stronger leader for your community. So once again, thanks everybody for coming, and you are all free to go.